Welcome, we're pleased to have you join us for the Sharing Ocean Acidification Resources for Communicators and Educators or SOURCE webinar today. Our series is presented to you by the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program in collaboration with National Marine Sanctuaries. Our goal is to provide ocean acidification communication tools to formal and informal educators and stakeholders and rights holders across the country to promote a more integrated and effective ocean acidification education community. I'm Liz Parati, and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. I'm joined today by Claire Feckler of uh, the National Education Liaison for the National Marine Sanctuaries and Canals Fellow, Natalie Lord. During the presentation, uh, attendees will be in listen-only mode. We are recording this presentation. It'll be available to you on our YouTube channel, and we'll put that link into the chat. You are welcome to type any questions or comments into the questions control panel that you should see at your GoTo meeting. We'll monitor incoming questions and respond to them or pose them to our speakers at the end of their presentation. Any uh, comments or questions can also uh, go into the chat. Uh, before we start though, we'd like to know who is in the audience and joining us today. Please take a minute to complete the poll, which you should find on the menu screen under polls, and we'll launch that right now. Looks like responses are still coming in. Okay, and we can show the results. And it looks like we have more than half of our visitors today are educators, um, some of researchers and some people joining us um, who are representing our general public. So welcome to the webinar. I next want to introduce our speakers today. Kirsten Wakefield is the Stakeholder Engagement Specialist with Maracus and the co-coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network, or MACAN. She received her master's in marine biology and biochemistry from University of Delaware and enjoys the challenges of working in the intersection of policy, climate science, and climate education. Sarah Nuss is the Education Coordinator for the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, or NIR, in Virginia, located at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. She came to VIMS after completing her master's degree in environmental studies from the College of Charleston and has worked with the National Research Reserve for the last 18 years. Also joining us is Anna Caputo, and she is the Marine Education Spe Specialist for the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarian Research Reserve in Virginia. Recently, she earned her master's degree in marine science from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and began working with the research reserve with a focus on outreach programming. Anna spent her graduate assistantship helping create curricula on coastal acidification and climate change for teachers. So thank you to our speakers. And with that, we'll start the presentation and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Liz, for that great introduction. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us at Coastal Acidification in the classroom today. I'm Kirsten Wakefield, um, as Liz mentioned, Stakeholder Engagement Specialist at Veracruz and a co-coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network. And I'm here along with Sarah Nuss and Anna Caputo today. We're really excited to share this new Coastal Acidification in the Classroom module that provides a regionally focused resource to help middle school and high school students gain a better understanding of estuarine chemistry and the effects of acidifying waters on our local marine life and habitats. And before we like to dive in, we'd like to do one more poll to see how many of you are currently teaching about acidification. Natalie, can we load that one up real quick? Looks like we're still waiting for voting to happen. A lot of votes coming in. Great, thanks Liz. Okay, 
Natalie, I think we can share the results. That's really fantastic to see that most everybody who's teaching about acidification is, is teaching both coastal and ocean acidification. So maybe our job here is done already today. <laughs> all right, do you want to bump back over, Sarah, to the presentation? Thanks. Um, all right, we'll go to the next slide. So some of you may not be familiar with the coastal acidification networks, and I'd just like to give a really quick overview of who we are and what role we have in coastal and ocean acidification. MACAN is one of six regional coastal acidification networks supported by NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. We're co-coordinated by Maracuse and Marco, and we're a network of folks involved in acidification research, resource management, policymaking, industry, and education. And we work together to understand acidification's impacts on our living marine resources and communities, and to observe and predict how water conditions are changing, and to share that information with local policymakers and community members so they can respond and adapt to future conditions. We're guided by a steering committee and four working groups focused on industry, science, policy, and outreach. Next slide, please. So back in 2020, one of the education priorities that MACAN's outreach working group identified was the need for a mid-Atlantic focused ocean and coastal certification toolbox for K through 12 teachers that could serve as a one-stop shop that we could host on the MACAN website so it'd be readily available. Although we found many teaching resources for ocean acidification, especially on the West Coast, few focus specifically on coastal acidification, which is much more of an issue in our mid-Atlantic estuaries, and there weren't any lessons specifically developed to investigate impacts to mid-Atlantic species and habitats. That is until now. Sarah and the nearest education coordinators from Delaware and New Jersey, who are enthusiastic members of MACAN's outreach working group, jumped right in to design this mid-Atlantic coastal acidification module. And over the past two years, they've tested and refined the curriculum through the Teachers on the Estuary Workshops and the Virginia Association of Science Teachers Conference. So I'll turn it over to Sarah and Anna now to introduce the module and the lessons that they've learned along the way. All right, thank you, Kirsten. Um, before we get too far into our presentation, we did want to provide an outline of what we are going to cover in this session. We do want to give a little bit of history to the module. It has been a several year process and we want to give some background information about why some of the choices that we've made have occurred. Um, then I will turn it over to Anna who will talk about what is actually in the module, um, what background information we provide, and also some of the activities that are included. And then we'll end our presentation with some next steps both for the curriculum and for training opportunities for teachers. So for those of you that may not be familiar with the NEARS, it is a set of 30 coastal sites that are designated to protect and study estuaries. We were established through the Coastal Zone Management Act and we represent a partnership between NOAA and the coastal states. So for example, my reserve, which is the Chesapeake Bay near in Virginia, our state partner is William & Mary or the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So NOAA provides funding and guidance for the NEARS um, and each site is managed on a daily basis by a lead state agency or university with input from local partners. Within um, each reserve, there are four main sectors, research, education, stewardship, and coastal training. Each reserve has an education coordinator such as myself and we have three mid-atlantic education coordinators that worked on this project as kirsten said new jersey and delaware um, and when we were shown the priorities that macan education work group had we saw a clear fit for our teacher professional development program which is called tote so again, if you are not familiar with tote um, we saw this clear fit for new and authentic data resources to share with our teachers that attend um, teachers on the estuary workshops. Each reserve around the country has conducted a needs assessment and market analysis of teacher needs in terms of data, online resources, classroom activities, and professional development. And several of our key requests, at least in Virginia, the last time that we did our needs assessment, um, would be met by the MACAN coastal acidification module. So we combined forces, Delaware, uh, near so the Jacques Cousteau near in New Jersey and my and my reserve and combined we would have access to several tote workshops and therefore access to a great subsample of teachers to run ideas by 
This project started in the summer of 2021. And at that time, we also had two amazing summer interns who were gonna lead this project. Um, Bethany Klein, who worked at the Delaware Near, and Greta Olson, who was a Noah Holling Scholar at the Virginia site, um, were two of the people that really got a lot of this work started for us. Um, as Kirsten noted, we did have specific module goals. Um, and in summer of 2021, when we started this work group, we first wanted to review, find, and create resources specific to the Mid-Atlantic region. One way we did this was through a survey to all 30 NEARS education coordinators to get a sense of what was already out there, um, even if it wasn't specific to our region of the Mid-Atlantic. We also felt it was important to differentiate between ocean and coastal acidification and to organize these resources into a teaching module geared towards secondary students. So we selected mostly high school level activities for this module because we felt like that aligned best with the standards. And it was really, really important to us that we solicited feedback from teachers. We didn't want to create this in a vacuum and assume what would be helpful for teachers. So teachers were our key partners throughout this project. Um, and so we pilot tested the, the module um, during TOTE that summer. And um, in our TOTE in 2021, unfortunately had to be completely virtual due to the pandemic, but we did have 22 teachers who were very active and participated in our workshop. Um, we solicited feedback from those teachers in two different ways. They submitted both informal feedback to us as we tested out activities with them online and also formal feedback that they um, submitted through an evaluation um, and a post-workshop survey specific to the coastal acidification um, activities. Some of the things that we received back from the teachers um, they did have limited experience with coastal acidification versus ocean acidification. Um, a lot of our teachers were very concerned about the chemistry aspect of teaching this. Um, and I will be upfront that most of the teachers that attended our tote that summer were not chemistry teachers. So I think there was obviously a bias towards biology and life science teachers. And so their third request was for more biology related activities that they felt would engage their students even more. They also really wanted more sample data sets um, or even data with an Easter egg or a phenomenon, a mystery that they were trying to solve. They suggested using some of our NEARS water quality data to compare and contrast changes in pH in the ocean versus coastal areas. Um, and again, they wanted that connection to biological impacts. So they gave us really great feedback on the draft module when it first began. We also surveyed them about um, what resources in the module were the most helpful. And these are the results from that pilot study, which also includes teachers from the New Jersey tote. So it's not just the 22 from my tote. Um, the teachers that we tested it with, again, were mostly high school teachers that taught biology or environmental science. So unfortunately, they were not as interested in the chemistry aspect of the module, which we'll talk about the module um, in more detail, but they were really interested in the background information and again, those ties to biology. We also asked them what resources we could add to the curriculum that would be the most helpful. And so this graph is showing the percentage of teachers that were interested in these options being added. So these were not in the curriculum at the time of the survey. So um, you can see again, the data sets and the biological impacts were the most interest. So then at the completion of summer 2021, we had all this data and we had a draft module. Um, we posted it online for teachers to access and we really didn't do a whole lot with it between the summer of 2021 and the spring of 2022 when we had a new graduate assistant join our um, CB Near group. And that was Anna. And Anna came on board and worked on polishing and finalizing the curriculum and really pulling it together into a cohesive curriculum. Um, Anna now works full time for this for CB Near. And so I will turn it over to her to give you more information about what we've done in the past year 
and um, where the curriculum is and how we've trained some teachers with the curriculum. Awesome, thanks Sarah. Um, so um, I wanna start by talking about what the module is a little bit more so we can have a better understanding of, of what exactly we're talking about. Um, so as we said before, the module is for high school students and it's basically a compilation of mid-Atlantic focused educational resources on ocean acidification and coastal acidification. And basically what our goals were, were to structure the curriculum so that there's a building of understanding from how fossil fuels contribute to the problem all the way to how watersheds and human impacts um, help exacerbate coastal acidification. This is also a living document, which is fairly unique for a module like this. And by living document, I mean we are constantly adding new activities as we come across them or as they're recommended by teachers or modifying current activities based on teacher feedback. We'll go over some of those modifications. Next slide. So here is a outline of just what the module contains. So it starts with an introduction of ocean acidification with a nice overview video. And there's also a demo activity that introduces pH and how pH and water interact. Then we go into specifically carbon and a carbon cycle activity where students get to take on the role of a molecule of carbon bouncing around earth and also bringing in the fossil fuel aspect. Then we jump into ocean acidification with two activities. One talking about how burning fossil fuels and specifically the combustion of fossil fuels causes ocean acidification. The second one talks about how animals, specifically shelled organisms and animals that have exoskeletons and use calcium carbonate, how they are going to be impacted by acidifying waters. That's actually a fan favorite and we're gonna go over it later in the uh, webinar. Then we get into specifically coastal acidification once that knowledge is built up with talking about um, watersheds, specifically there's a NOAA coastal acidification anima animation that goes over that really well. And then there's a data activity where students get to look at real data. And then we end with biological impacts of ocean acidification, coastal acidification with a video talking about squid and then a food activity as well. Next slide. In addition to all that, we have extensive background knowledge uh, or background information for teachers so that teachers can then feel confident in what they are teaching. And this actually goes over a great deal more than what we actually include in the curriculum, which is great. So teachers can pick and choose how they want to incorporate that information that goes over everything from carbon cycles to pH scales, um, how oceans are acidifying, the science of coastal acidification, et cetera, et cetera. So we use infographics like the one that you are looking at currently to show and explain the differences between coastal acidification, ocean acidification, since that's really the point of what we were trying to do. Um, the module does a good job explaining in layman's terms all the science that's happening so that any teacher can feel confident in the content. Next slide. So what we did most recently, the first thing that we ended up doing in the year of 2022 was we presented this curriculum as a resource at the Virginia Association of Science Teachers Conference in, I believe that was last November. And we demoed two activities. One was a Lego activity and the other was a data activity to just sort of introduce the module as a whole. 
Now, this group of teachers, while the presentation was more of an informal um, audience, since the teachers could leave at any time they wanted, really, um, but the subsection of teachers we had ended up being more chemistry focused, which was great. So they gave us feedback on our activities that we shared with them, one of them being the shell building activity. And we were actually able to then modify that activity based on their feedback, including a data worksheet for students so that they can better keep track of the information that they were learning. The second workshop that we went through with this module was our tote workshop in the past in 2023. Um, we actually dedicated a whole day to coastal acidification in our tote workshop. And the idea was our, our plans were to take the teachers out into the field where we can do some testing and hands-on activities. Um, however, it rained the entire week, so we had to transfer things into an indoor setting. But we were also able to invite a MayCan scientist, so Dr. Janet Vermeer, um, came and spoke to the teachers and gave a lecture all about ocean and coastal acidification. We demoed some activities, and then we demoed a activity that we were considering adding in to the module, and we would still like to, um, but we learned some things from doing that. So next slide. So the new activity that we were looking at that we introduced to these teachers um, was developed by May Can and by uh, Dr. Ramir, which basically was able to explore impacts of acidification through using real-time data and data sets, which was something the teachers were asking for, um, which was awesome. So the pros of this being like it was real data that real scientists could use. Um, but students then could play around with, with the goal of helping to increase data literacy. And some, this was something that we were thinking about placing towards the end of the curriculum, where if students already had that buildup of understanding, they can then play around with different parameters. However, um, there were two things, two challenges that we found with the activity. One was teachers were finding that they wanted more of a, a guidance for the data, like a step-by-step, -step, this is how we do it. And then also we found out that a lot of schools have trouble using Excel sheets, which is something that we had not anticipated, um, where Chromebooks cannot download Excel and a lot of anything that you download with school systems actually has to be vetted by administration within each school. So there were a lot of hoops for then teachers to jump through to be able to use this. Um, we'd like to be able to include an activity uh, or this activity in the future though, once we start working through that. Next slide. So I have been talking about a Lego activity and I'd also mentioned a data activity that we had been sharing with teachers. So I thought that we'd run through those activities very briefly so that you can understand what it is that we were talking about. These were both fan favorites of t-shirt teachers. So let's explore those. So next slide. So the first activity I want to talk about is that shell building activity. So in this activity, basically, we have Legos of different colors that represent either molecules or ions. So we have red Legos, which represent hydrogen, which is ultimately representative of the increasing acidity in your ocean. Then you have yellow Legos, which are carbonate blue, which is calcium, and then combinations of yellow and blue would be calcium carbonate, and yellow and red would be bicarbonate. So you put all these Legos into a bag, and each round you will have 60 seconds to pull one Lego at a time out and start stacking. The goal being to stack blue and yellow Legos to build calcium carbonate, 
students are taking on the role of like a shell building animal in that way, like an oyster or scallop or something. However, if they pull out a red hydrogen ion, they then have to create these bicarbonate stacks, which takes away the energy from building up their calcium carbonate structures. Next slide. So the way that we do this is the paper bag or some sort of like opaque bag that students are using represents your ocean. And there are three different rounds that students will do this activity. The round one activity represents a pre-industrial revolution ocean. So the pH is what we would expect an ocean pH to be around like 8.2 ish. So you would have two hydrogen ions in the bag. Then they go through the whole activity. Round two, it would be present day conditions where the pH changes to 8.1. So there would be three Legos in the bag at that point. They do the activity again, write down their data, their observations. And then round three is sort of this pre business as usual pre or post industrial future ocean where the pH of the ocean is then 7.9 and you have six red Legos or six hydrogen ions in your ocean. So that increasing acidity over time will um, hopefully show students the, the changes and, and how hard it is for, for animals to then start building up those structures. Next slide. So from our tote workshop, our most recent tote workshop, those teachers actually gave us more feedback on this activity. So the graph or the table that we showed in the last slide was from the VAST or Virginia um, teachers workshop that we did this with, um, where they wanted students to actually write out a data table. So our tote teachers suggested that we take that one step further and actually add a graphing component. So we created this worksheet for students to do where they can actually graph each round of how much calcium carbonate they had each time. And hopefully they would see that decreasing over time. And then there are some very simple questions that go along with the graphing as well. Next slide. So the second activity that I do want to mention is all about specifically coastal acidification. And this is our major coastal acidification activity in the curriculum, in the module. So it starts by using a coastal acidification animation that NOAA has put out. Um, we found out earlier yesterday that the animation in the curriculum, the link to it is not currently working. So if you go to our curriculum right now and click that link, unfortunately, you just get a perpetual loading screen. Um, we have found a workaround link, but we have to modify that and we'll put the link into the chat later so that you can actually see what that looks like. But the animation is essentially a watershed um, and you go through different seasons and it talks about how that impacts coastal acidification. So once students do that, next slide, they then get to read more in depth about different seasonal pH changes by looking at these two infographics and they get to read through there. And it goes over factors that can affect ocean acidification like CO2 absorption, upwelling, freshwater inputs, biological removal of CO2, and eutrophication a little bit more. Um, just so students have the background information to then do the main bit of the activity. Next slide. Uh, so that main bit of the activity is this, uh, where students actually get to look at real data um, so this is actually pH trends from Rutgers University in New Jersey that were taken by an, an autonomous glider and it shows the pH over four different seasons, so winter, spring, summer, and fall. And students can 
clearly see with these bright colors what the different trends are. And then there is an accompanying worksheet where students get to make sense of what they're actually looking at. So it starts with very simple questions like what is measured on the y-axis, what's measured on the x-axis, what range of pH do you see on there, and it goes all the way to which season has the highest pH and why do you think that might be? So they're using their background information that they got from the infographics and from the animations. And if you want to take a closer look at all of the questions in the worksheet and that, you can go ahead and check out the curriculum, which we will link to in the chat. Next slide. So um, that is essentially what we have for the module. We do have future plans for um, the idea is that we can seek some funding to do either more teacher professional development um, or maybe the development of additional lessons and activities like I've mentioned before that we can incorporate into the module. And we're always looking for teacher feedback for lessons so we can change and modify as needed. Um, basically, we want to make something that is useful, that is going to be used, and that is going to be a beneficial resource. So we're always looking for that feedback. All right. Thanks, Anna. Um, so we do have the link to the module here, and I think it's also been put in the chat. We definitely want to thank you for attending, but before you go, we do have some additional poll questions for you that um, will hopefully will help us as we plan future efforts around coastal acidification education. So I think we have a few questions we'll pull up. People are just starting to vote. Okay. waiting on a couple more responses coming in. Okay, Natalie, if you could share. All right, that's definitely helpful. Biology still leading the pack. All right, <laughs> do we have another question? As people start voting on this, it looked like uh, more than half of the respondents wanted more information on chemistry and then the bio biological impacts, uh, which reflects, you know, the sort of the needs that we're seeing across the country, not just in this region. Okay, let's take a look at these results. Okay, great. This is super so helpful. Again, more than 50% wanting the, the pH um, versus open ocean and connecting pH with biological life, uh, life cycles and majority looking uh, at activities on biological impacts. Okay, great. Did we have one more? I think there's one more. Okay, this is the last one. Last one. <laughs> and this is for both formal and informal educators or um, researchers who may want to kind of adapt this to the work that they're doing as well. I know we had some researchers in the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like most people have voted. Okay. Um, so yeah, virtual, so virtual workshops may be more feasible for a lot of educators. 
um, either sort of a couple hours or up to a half day. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for answering our poll questions. At this time, I think we are open for questions. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we have plenty of time for questions and we have several from the audience. I'm just, um, if you have any last minute questions or comments, again, feel free to put that into the questions box as we go through this. Um, can you please share the slide with the contact again? Um, so I think that's looking for the contact for this curriculum. Maybe you guys could put that in the chat. Um, we do have the link in the chat to this module. Um, so you can go and find that there. Um, and we can post that again. Um, um, just some comments on thank you. Yep, go ahead, Anna. I do want to mention there are two different links. Both will take you to the curriculum. I just made one tiny URL, which looked better on the slide. But both are the same. <laughs> Great. Yeah, feel free to put that in the chat again for people. Uh, just uh, some comments here. Thanks. This was helpful information. Great to see coastal acidification um, being, you know, being included in the sort of teaching modules. Um, we do have a question about um, kind of like the early stages of the development of this module, and it's um, when was the most recent needs assessment that you had mentioned? And did the teacher needs change over the development of this module? And as they were using it in the classroom, you, you had mentioned that this has gone through kind of a multi-year evolution. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, what you were hearing from teachers? Sure, so if you wanna dive really deep into the needs assessment, we also have that posted on our website for um, Virginia, but we did our most recent needs assessment in 2020. We um, typically do them every five to 10 years. So we'll have another one coming up and sometime between 2025 and 2030. Um, and I would say that I have, my older one is also posted on our website. There are data always is ranked as a high need for teachers um, in across the 18 years that I've been here. Um, I don't think that that necessarily has changed the request for types of professional development similar to that last question that we just asked that has definitely changed over time but um locally relevant data stories um seem to be a continual trend in our teachers that have at least completed our needs assessment so um in between needs assessments we work with um teachers that are sort of on an advisory committee to our reserve to ask them about their needs. Um, coastal acidification wasn't necessarily an identified topic area, but it is a way to build those graphing and data skills that teachers were looking for. So that's why we felt like it was a good partnership um, of the two. Great. Um... We have a question here from Jessica Frazier. Um, how do you plan to promote this module to the public? I know this is a module kind of developed for high school teachers, um, you know, but it, and it is on these two websites. Um, do you have any additional plans to kind of make this accessible? Anna, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Um, I mean, we can joint answer it, but basically what we've been doing currently is promoting it through a lot of teacher workshops. We present it at like VAS, so the Virginia Association of Science Teachers, um, which reaches a wide audience. Um, currently, we don't have any um, online promotion other than doing a lot of in-person workshops. Yeah, and I would just add to that that most of our focus has been on formal education um, there potentially could be opportunities for us to host public outreach events focused on this topic, um, but we haven't done that so far. We've just been focusing on teachers. Great, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, do you, I have one question here. Do you have anything for middle school level students? Um, some of the activities you mentioned may be adaptable or kind of, you, you know, this is a module, so maybe it could be adapted. Could you speak more to that? Um, yeah, so there are definitely lessons that are adaptable. It depends on, of course, the science standards of the state that you're in. Um, 
but I think that Lego activity could probably be adapted. And honestly, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us and we, we can help you um, ad adapt them if you're, if you're looking for that. But yeah, totally do that if you can. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'll mention that this module is also included on the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program searchable uh, resources web webpage. So it, you know, if you were looking for curricula or if you're looking for, um, uh, if you're a certain audience such as teachers or students or general public, this would pop up on there. Um, and I'll put um, the link into the chat where if you are looking for middle school, uh, resources, you can find it through that searchable database. Uh, but you will find this module there as well. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I'd also like to put a plug yep. in that it's on the MAKIN website as well, on the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network website. And we're currently in the process of revamping that, so it'll look a little different in a couple of months. But we will also be posting some short educational videos um, that can be used as a complement along with the module too. So keep an eye out for those. They'll be coming in a couple of months. Yeah, great to hear about the videos. And I'll, I'll, we did put it in earlier, the MACAN site earlier into the chat, but I'll just pop that in here again. Thanks, um, let's see. Yep, uh, let's see other questions. Um, anything in uh, other languages like a Spanish version? Is that, part, you know, are any of the materials available or is that kind of part of a broader plan? That is an excellent consideration. And we would love to do that in the future. We currently don't have anything, but I, I think that's a really important thing that we look into. And maybe in the future with additional funding sources, that could be a, um, a project that we work on. Um, I'm just seeing a, a question here. Uh, maybe relating this to some um, overlapping interest with shellfish growers. So we have a comment here from Sally McGee that says she manages Shellfish Growers Climate Coalition with the Nature Conservancy and their farmer and grower members are very interested in helping students understand the impacts of climate change on shellfish and their businesses. Um, and they don't want like to reinvent curriculum, but want to connect farmers and teachers and maybe experts like you who are developing this content um, you know, maybe incorporating a field trip or, you know, some content that kind of brings that to the classroom. Uh, wondering if there's a way that you can connect. So um, if you guys could put your relevant contact information in the chat, Ellie can get a hold of you, uh, maybe for future connections of bringing that to the classroom as well, building on these great efforts. Definitely. That's a large part of what we do is field experiences for students. So I think that would be a great connection. Excellent. And uh, someone had uh, coming back to the Spanish version uh, or Spanish resources question. Um, uh, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program will um, hopefully have an intern this summer to turn some of our kind of evergreen materials that can help serve efforts like this, um, and putting that into Spanish. So hopefully in the next year, you'll start to see some content a little more accessible through our website. Uh, one question, um, since we still have some time here, uh, pH is so easily affected by other factors like salinity, oxygen. Uh, when students determine pH, they can easily be misled about ocean acidification. Um, how are you kind of uh, addressing that um, within the module? Well, or is that kind of beyond the scope? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing specifically in there yet that talks about um, like students having an understanding, like not walking away thinking that the ocean is acidic, right? Um, which is something that we recently were told might be an issue um, just generally as this, this subject is taught. Um, I know in the background information for teachers section, there is like a, a good chunk about just pH and teaching pH, but adding an activity that specifically goes over pH might be something we do in the future. Great, thank you. Yeah, pH is always a, a tricky part and the level and time of, to which teachers can dedicate to addressing that is important. Um, but as pointed out here by Diana, 
it's so uh, important for these curricula to avoid those misconceptions that we've learned can happen over the last decade and a half as we see more and more outreach um, coming into the classrooms and in other venues. It's a great, great comment there. Um, and thanks for addressing that. Um, and actually, here's another question kind of uh, along those lines. Any sense of what the main confusions or misconceptions are for teachers when they talk about coastal acidification? And was the infographic that you developed for this um, effective in, in helping them kind of navigate that? Anna, do you want to take that or me? Um, either or. The only thing, um, the thing that popped up into my head about that was the majority of what we had been seeing from the teachers we had talked to was there was just a general um, lack of knowledge about what coastal, acidific uh, coastal acidification was in the first place and like how it was different from ocean acidification. Uh, a lot of our teachers, again, are not chemistry specific, at least the ones that we've been working with. So there was a definite understanding of like, the ocean is getting more acidic. There was a little less just general knowledge about like, how is that different in a coastal environment. So that's pretty much what we were trying to get at with the module was just going over the, the very basics of it. Yeah, and building from ocean acidification, a topic that they're more familiar with, into coastal. I think the infographic does an excellent job of identifying the main inputs that add to the effects um, for coastal acidification. And we got only positive comments on the infographic. So I think it's a very strong part of the curriculum. And that's again, um, that infographic is linked in this module, correct? And is on the MACAN website as well? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, it was actually developed by a team of researchers up through the Sea Grant North Atlantic, Atlantic Regional team um, a couple of years ago. So a lot of great um, research scientists kind of got together and pulled that information together and sent it out for everybody to use. That's great to hear. Um, the data that was used in the module that um, you got the feedback was just kind of too much for like the computers to handle and for the, for the students to handle. Um, are there, uh, the source was from um, non-NOAA sources, right? Are there NOAA resources that could be used to help with that effort? I don't know that we've had a chance <laughs> to breathe since summer has happened to really um, yeah. dive into that. I think it wasn't necessarily that the data was, there was too much data. I mean, maybe there was too much data. I think the main issue was that the lesson was very exploratory and historically from the teachers that I've worked with, they need, like they need, and their students definitely need the step-by-step, -step, like click on this and then click on this, step one, step two. And so I think a lot of them got lost a little bit in the process of looking at the data it was it was open ended so i don't think that the data itself is necessarily but we can't use it it's just we need to develop tighter instructions um and then of course the issue with the chromebooks that was a different issue um and they the teachers were very interested in using it if we could figure out a way to use it through google um instead of through microsoft so um definitely something that we are thinking about because we know that the data set activities are important just as much as the biological impacts ones. Um, I'm sure that there are other resources through NOAA also that would be helpful. Great. Thank you for that. Um, that's Those are all the questions I'm seeing in our chat. Um, we were able to cover a lot of things, which is great. Um, so, you know, unless there are any last minute questions people want to put into the question box, um, I want to thank our three panelists here for presenting this great resource. Um, hopefully all of you have found multiple avenues by which you can access this and related information. Keep an eye out for future developments, including those accompanying videos that Kirsten mentioned. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Natalie to kind of wrap us up. Hi, ladies. Thank you so much for your awesome presentation. It was very informative for our community. Um, 
this now concludes our, oh, we do have a question problem. Oh, thank you, everyone saying thank you. Um, so we are always accepting any ideas for speakers that you might have or topic areas that you are interested in learning from communicators and educators on ocean acidification specifically. So please um, shoot us an email. That's at noaa.oceanacidification at noaa.gov. Um, next month, we will be hearing from Alex Zimmerman, who is an Ocean Acidification Program Education Mini Grant recipient. Um, they're from Indiana University, and they developed um, an interactive and decision-based game that relates food web dynamics to ocean acidification impacts. So we're going to be learning about how they develop the game and how they can incorporate that with their um, OA curriculum at a broader scale. And with that, we will conclude this webinar. Thank you so much again, ladies. Thank you for having us.